Broadcasting from the Unshackled Studios in Melbourne, this is Wilms Front, brought to you by theunshackled.net. Now here's Tim Wilms. It's the first show of Australia's 2020 winter season. Uh, no second wave of the coronavirus has come with it, like we were told would be happening in my home state of Victoria at the beginning of June. Uh, our pubs, restaurants and cafes were finally able to uh, reopen, although limited to 20 patrons at once, and you had to provide your contact details upon entry to dine in for coronavirus uh, contact tracing purposes. I wined and dined on Monday evening and it was bloody fantastic. I thoroughly enjoyed just sort of getting out of forgetting about this sort of whole world and just sort of having a, a fun night uh, with friends. It was great. Uh, the next scheduled relaxation in Victoria is uh, scheduled for uh, June 22nd when gyms and cinemas can be reopen and venue limits will be raised to 50 unless uh, Premier Dan Andrews finds an excuse to renege on this promise. Uh, Victoria, through its mass testing blitz, now has a positive rate of 0.3%, the lowest of any state and territory in Australia. We have uh, less than 500 active coronavirus cases nationwide. Deaths attributed to the coronavirus virus have actually gone down to uh, 102 uh, since that 30-year-old uh, mi uh, minor who died in uh, central Queensland last week. Uh, uh, another test has uh, said that he didn't have the, the coronavirus. So actually, uh, actually, our death toll has gone down, believe it or not. Australians, especially those who've been stood down and had their businesses closed, are quite rightly state, uh, stating the economic reopening in each state and territory is too slow to happen. Uh, but the most egregious aspect of the, the lockdowns was that our rights to public free speech and assembly were deemed uh, not essential or a reasonable excuse to be outside of the home, so were hence suspended. Here in Victoria, we saw Victoria Police disgracefully shut down the Mother's Day anti-lockdown protest outside Parliament House and physically drag away the key speakers and organisers. Victoria Police were present at this past Saturday's anti-lockdown protest at the Royal Botanical Gardens in Melbourne. Uh, they did not move in this time to shut down the protest, but did bark at the attendees uh, from time to time to maintain social uh, distancing, even though it didn't look like they were. I've had some of the, the faces of uh, Victoria's anti-lockdown movement on previous episodes of Wilms Front, such as uh, Nick Patterson, uh, uh, Thanos uh, Panides, and uh, Rafael Fernandez. But there's also been a visible anti-lockdown movement in New South Wales, where their lockdown has been at its height as strict as Victoria's, though they are faster, or should I say, uh, slightly faster on, on, on the way out. One of the faces of Victoria's anti-lockdown movement has been uh, Victor Tay, who's created the Exercising My Rights social media outlet. Uh, Victor's a Sydney sider, husband and father of six children. He's a Christian bishop at the Church of Liverpool, which he founded in 2015. He has been exercising every Saturday afternoon for the past eight weeks outside New South Wales Parliament House between 2 and 4 p.m. with his Liberty headband, which he's got on now, and his sign that says, uh, uh, Save Lives and the Lockdowns. His political speech while exercising has frequently attracted the ire of the New South Wales Police Force, but he has remained undeterred, returning every uh, Saturday afternoon to exercise and uh, plans to continue doing so. Uh, I'm glad to be joined by Victor tonight. Welcome to Wilmsfront. How are you doing? It's good to be here. Uh, now, it was Sunday, March 29th, so, which feels like a, a lifetime ago, where uh, Scott Morrison, after a national cabinet hookup, uh, pre pretty much uh, said without saying that we we're going to a, a full lockdown, which that had actually been fueling, I think, the panic buying more than the, the virus itself. The supermarket shelves were still empty at that time because they thought that there was going to be a full lockdown and even the the, the supermarkets uh, were going to be shut. That uh, hasn't happened. But Scott Morrison said you're only allowed out for essential reasons and only with one other person not in your household or family. So it was basically house arrest. Uh, New South Wales, the fines were $1,000. In my home state of Victoria, they were 1652 uh, for myself, who had supported some of the, the shutdowns, this was way too far uh, and draconian. Some would say it was foolish to think that uh, the government uh, wouldn't go this far. And we had new restrictions announced by the day. How did you read the, the situation up until 
that point where we were at full lockdown. How did I read the situation? Just just clarify what you mean by that. Well, the obviously, uh, the the a pandemic uh, was declared worldwide. The the virus was here. Our curve was increasing with uh, at its at its at its peak was four hundred new cases uh, a day and. We know a lot more about the virus right, now right. than we did before, but uh, uh, I guess what you're saying, like, what were my thoughts at that time when when he had announced that lockdown? And what were your thoughts on the the virus itself? Right. So I think for myself, even by that time, I was already skeptical of the numbers. So even by that time, I was thinking, and I'd, I'd watched some things and listened to some things here that uh, the the data was very unreliable in terms of the numbers that they were giving. Uh, for example, I always sort of mentioned when they first announced that the coronavirus was, you know, whatever times more deadly than the seasonal flu. Ben Swan did a really quite a really good piece on that where he sort of showed that when they had quoted the uh, mortality rate of the coronavirus, they had used the case fatality rate of like 3.4% or something like that. Um, but then when they compared it to the seasonal flu, they they used an infection fatality rate. And I thought that was sort of misleading and, and all that sort of stuff. So I won't rehash all the information. A lot of the information is on uh, on my website. Um, that sort of made me doubt, you know, whether it was as deadly as it was. But even if it was a uh, a more dangerous disease than the seasonal flu, I thought the fact that the government could stop you from going out and stop you from gathering um, as a church or going out um, for whatever reason you like, having that freedom of movement, was already an infringement on rights um, on our God-given rights. So. That's that's what sort of moved me to do something because when that happened, and it feels like feels like quite a long time ago now. When you when you said 29th of March, it's like ah, oh, feels like a long time ago. Um, I think when it first crept into my life was when it actually uh, hindered us from meeting as a church. So that's when we started deciding, hey, what were we going what were we going to do? How were we going to respond to that? And that's what sort of sparked the idea to um, you know exercise with a sign and express um, the opposition, and hopefully that would. Um, encourage others to speak up as well. And when you reflect on it, it's particularly egregious and outrageous that we need an excuse uh, to be uh, to be outside the the home. That uh, uh, probably uh, the Victoria Police were out in force uh, here in my state uh, during the the Easter uh, long weekend, where they really had a had a blitz and. It, it, to, to me, it was just like that you could get pulled over by the police, not uh, for any type of infringement or, or anything, uh, but uh, they, it, 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 that uh, they just suspected you were out of the home for what they deemed to be, or what they wanted to check that you're out for, for non-essential reasons. I think we've lost uh, Victor there for a moment. Certainly uh, not a problem on my end. Down on my feet. Yeah, that was oh, your that's my face, is it? Yeah. Oh, okay, sorry. I was, okay. I was just having a bit yeah, of a rant about that. Sorry, the, I missed all of that. Yeah, I was just having a rant about the outrageousness that we need uh, that uh, we needed to provide the state with an excuse or why we were outside of our home. Like, I'd never thought that would happen in our society. Yeah, neither did I. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, I completely agree with you. I'm, I'm completely against the lockdown. It's... Uh, it's it, it, I, uh, I think everybody should have the freedom to decide what risks they take. So if they want to take the risk and go out, they should be able to. But shutting some, see, if somebody wants to close their business down because they're concerned, they have the right to do that. But when somebody says that their business needs to close down to protect everybody else, that's an infringement on their right to work and their right freedom of movement. And yeah, absolutely. I think I, I completely agree with you. I'm completely against the draconian lockdown. Uh, now your church, uh, I'll just bring it up on the on the on the screen here. Uh, do a screen share. The the church in Liverpool, and you've got here a COVID update from the twentieth of May. Due to the current restrictions in place, we're currently gathering in a home with limited space. Therefore, we have only opened these meetings up to existing members. Once public gatherings in the hall we rent is permitted again, we'll be opening back up our meetings to the general uh, public. So you, uh, as yet, can't hold your uh, church meetings or practice your uh, religion as, well, you've been able to in Australia for since its existence. 
Yeah, exactly. And and we actually have a constitutional right to do it. I mean, I didn't realize until recently, but section, I think it's 116 or 117 of the constitution is actually a right that is legally protected in Australia. It's actually, we don't I'm have just going to, sorry, pull you up there. It's that there's no religious test uh, to have any sort of government position of that. It's not a strictly a right to, to freedom of religion. That's another reason why the government has been able to steamroll our rights. We do basically have no rights in the constitution. Oh, really? Because the way it's worded, it says that it can't prohibit the free exercise of a religion either. I don't know if... Uh, well, let's look it I've up. One. I've got here right next to me, actually. So All right. Maybe, uh, uh, 116. You may be right. I'm not a constitutional lawyer by any stretch of the imagination. But the way I read it, it says here, um, section 116, Commonwealth not to legislate in respect of religion. The Commonwealth shall not make any law for establishing any religion or for imposing any religious observance, or for prohibiting the free exercise of any religion, and no religious test shall be required as a qualification for any office or public trust under the Commonwealth. So you're sort of alluding to the second half, but the, the first half is saying it, it's like, it sounds like a bit like the First Amendment in the United States Bill of Rights, right? Don't establish any religion, you can't force people to observe any religion, and you can't prohibit the free exercise of one. So do you read it that way, or did you, do you understand it differently? Well, maybe uh, you should see if you can launch your own high court challenge to the, the church closed closures because, well, uh, th as, as we've, we've come to know, uh, uh, guessing what the high court is going to rule, it's a, it's a mugs game. And uh, we know that there's those two high court uh, cases, one by Clive Palmer, one facilitated by Pauline Hanson to challenge Queensland and WA uh, border closures. Yeah, I heard closures. about this, yeah. Mm. I noticed you had the constitution yeah, so right in front of you there. No, because what happened, I didn't have it there specifically for this chat, it's because somebody had sent me a message and um, they said, hey, you can buy these Australian constitutions for $2 from Parliament House. So I bought like a bunch of them for my church members. And so I just happened to have one sitting right next to me. So um, it, it was because we were... I don't know who had pointed it out to me. I, I was looking at uh, knowyourrightsgroup.com.au. So Mike Palmer does a lot of good work there. And uh, I think one of my mates had, had bought his Know Your Rights book. And in there, it talks about different sections. So I was researching just recently because of these lockdowns, like what our rights were in Australia, because I know we don't have a Bill of Rights. We have certain rights that are actually mentioned in our constitution. And then we have implied rights, but we don't have all the rights that, say, America have legally protect because we don't not have a bill of rights. Not many individual rights is to be specific. Yeah, so one thing I found interesting in it was, wow, uh, the, the freedom to exercise a religion is actually stated as one of the sections in the Constitution. So that was like even a stronger case for how they could, how can they shut down places of worship when that's plainly stated in the Australian Constitution, which is meant to be the highest law in the land. So the reason why we're not able to be, meet in our building is because the we we rent a community centre and because the you know obviously that building does not belong to us I can't just use it when I like um, that they have actually closed down the community centre so I don't know if in two weeks time that's actually going to change um, maybe they'll open it back up but the community centre we rent because of the social distancing rules it's limited to I think thirty six even though normally it holds eighty to one hundred. So I still don't know what's going to happen even when it opens up anyway and how the council is going to go about that. So uh, does that answer your question? I don't know. I can't remember what your question was. Yeah, 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 yeah it does. <laughs> uh, would you like yeah. to uh, build a, a proper uh, church uh, for your congregation to, to meet one that you own and operate? Well, a proper building. So a church is a congregation of people. So I know most people think of a church as a, as a building, um, but... I mean, oh, yeah, obviously, one day, if, if we, if our church has the funds and we have the means to be able to have our own building, um, but I think that that's just for every church to weigh up whether or not that's the best use of their finances. So um, our church is quite small. You know, we've only got, like, you know, less than 10000 in the bank, so it's not like we have a, a ton of money. So, uh, And I know that uh, Scott Morrison, our Prime Minister, on social media and uh, in uh, a lot of the, the, the left-wing press, he's, he's mocked for his uh, uh, Pentecostal religion called uh, a Happy Clapper. Of course, he uh, has attended uh, Hillsong conferences. Yet yep. under his Prime Ministership, he has shut down all uh, places of worship. Yeah, I know. I mean, what... 
What can you say about that, eh? I mean, you would think that a prime minister that is supposedly a devoted Christian himself would do all he can to, you know, promote um, the freedom of religion in our country. But, you know, I mean, I don't know, you know, obviously people can believe what they want about Scott Morrison. Is he is he sincere or not? I mean, I think as a politician, he's got to play both sides. He probably weighed up in his own head uh, what would be more politically expedient, whether to go with the medical advice and shut down and, you know, shut down our freedoms and everything like that. And and judging from the response from most of Australians, I mean, you and I would probably be in the minority. So um, I, I would think that somebody like Scott Morrison would would know what he's doing. I mean, he didn't take he didn't get the top job because he's an idiot, right? So I think he knows um, how to sort of scope the political climate. And unfortunately, it seems that you know either he is not, you know, either I'm uh, misinterpreting the constitution wrongly, or he's gotten some bad advice. And he has done something that is infringed upon our rights. Uh, you would hope to think that he did it ignorantly, but it's a bit hard to believe that somebody of that clout would do something ignorantly. They know exactly what they're doing. Um, whether they are well-intentioned or not is to be seen. Uh, when did you decide to, to launch uh, Exercising My Rights? Uh, because uh, you've got the, the, the T-shirts, uh, you've uh, got the, the, the website and the, the, the logo. That's, that's no uh, overnight uh, job. It takes, a, it takes a, a lot of planning and, and that. And uh, I'm not sure if this is your first uh, foray uh, into uh, activism. Uh, obviously, you've gained quite a following on, on social uh, media. Uh, a, a, a lot of people, they just, I think they just admire your, your courage to just uh, uh, go out there and you always have, uh, and I think this is what uh, annoys uh, people who support the lockdown is that you've always got a smile on your face. <laughs> they're, 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 it, it's, it's called the, the, the killer uh, smile. So when did you decide this is something you wanted to uh, put your energy into? And obviously, uh, you've got a wife and, and six children. That's a very large family. You're only 33. Uh, 34. 34. Uh, so mm. uh, you, you, you've had quite... Uh, already achieved quite a bit uh, in your in your in your short life obviously you need to have their support as well to do this so uh, just talk us through the uh, thinking the idea and then implementing it okay sure um, well, in terms of my smile I, I think this is just my natural demeanor you know I you know I'm the sort of person when you're nervous you smile and I'm just always smiling I remember my friends uh, when I used to preach in the United States they would just say stop smiling when you're preaching even when I'm like preaching on serious topics and it's it, get, it gets me into trouble sometimes I mean even it got me into trouble in a live stream where um, a dad unfortunately was he was sharing his vaccine injury story and I, I was smiling as I do just because that's I was concentrating on the live and then he had shared actually a very sad story and I had actually missed hearing it because of everything that was going along and somebody had distracted me and and, and I got a bit of flack for that so of course I, I felt terrible when I realized that had happened on the live stream later but to to go back to your question uh I, I have, um, our, our church is five years old and unfortunately I don't have anybody that is, um, you know, very good at, you know, websites and media and comms and all that sort of stuff. So I've had to learn all that myself um, over the past five years. So in terms of creating a website and creating a simple logo with the tools I have, I can bang that up pretty quickly together because I've had to create websites in the past for, for whatnot. So that's sort of the an area that I, I'm a bit more well versed in and I have some people to help me with that. So when the lockdown happened and we didn't really know what to do for church, so a few of the men got together, it was about two weeks after he had made that announcement and we got together to decide, okay, what are we going to do? We had a few options. Do we do X? Do we do Y? So that conversation came to, well, we couldn't even, if we wanted to organize a protest, we couldn't even do that. Um, I had I had participated in protests before. I am all for protests. Um, like I told you, I've been to a few before. I went to the abortion rallies and marches as well. So I, the, the, the discussion kind of went, well, we can't even protest because that's illegal. And then we sort of talked about, well, are we allowed to do under the law? So the conversation kind of led one to another saying, well, technically you can travel anywhere to exercise. So I'm like, oh, okay, well, okay. and then the conversation was, well, can, uh, does the law restrict you from what you can wear when you exercise? Well, no, well, maybe we'll wear like a shirt with a message on it. 
And then it was like, well, does the law restrict you from carrying anything when you exercise? Well, no, because, I mean, you can carry exercise equipment. You can dress however you want. So that's what sort of sparked the idea of, well, I'll go out and I'll exercise and I'll carry a sign and that'll be my exercise equipment. And then I'll have a reasonable excuse to leave my home. So one thing kind of led to another where we now we were joking, you know, when you, as you do and a bunch of friends, when you're just throwing wild ideas out there, it's like, oh, let's call it exercising my rights and let's try and get people to dress up in their exercise gear. And, you know, we'll have an icon, right? The icon is going to be this headband. It's so obvious that I'm like, you know, this sweat van with Liberty on it. So these ideas just were starting to flow and we were joking about different exercises. So that's where the idea of Liberty lunges came from. So the idea actually happened quite quickly. So that, that, that us getting together, thinking of the idea, creating the website, making the shirt, getting the headband, this all happened within a week. So it was like, I think we had met like on a Monday night and then we're like, Hey, this is the idea. I floated it with a few people. And then I, we said, okay, I'll, Am, am I going to do this? Are you guys behind me? And then we're like, let's do it. So um, we got a website together. I just banged a logo together and we created the social media accounts. The first Saturday, um, nobody knew the first Saturday we were going, right? Because we, we went the first Saturday just to scope it out and see if the police would give me any trouble. So I went with one other guy because you can exercise with one other person. So that's where you see that first video that we created where it's just us going around the city doing it. So we just came up with this idea, all right, we'll go around the city, we'll tape some funny exercises and put a video together and then use that video and the one I created at my home to sort of tell people what the idea was to just get the word out and see if people would do the same. And, uh, and that's how it happened. So it did actually... It did require some planning, but it all happened quite quickly, or within maybe three or four days. Before you uh, started this, uh, were you already a, a fitness uh, fanatic? I mean, uh, the, you look uh, fit, uh, but uh, has exercise been been something that uh, you did uh, uh, did quite frequently previously? Well, I've always been active in my life. I mean, probably in the last five years, I've been less active because I've got like a desk job and with a family, you don't have as much time. So, you know, I do play, so I did play soccer every now and then, and I was starting to get into jujitsu. But, you know, uh, you know, as, as uh, I've just always been blessed with struggling to put on weight. So, you know, where some people struggle to keep weight off, I've always been somebody that's always been skinny. Like, and it's kind of been a blessing to me because now that I'm 34 years old, I just look normal. But when I was like 18, 19, 20, I was, you know, you'd, I'd be like this scrawny little Asian boy. So it's funny how when you're Asian, you know, you got the, you got the scrawny genes and you got the young genes, but then when you're 34, it, it, it works out good for you, right? You got the eternal youth. <laughs> yeah, a a Asians, they, they, uh, they uh, age later or age better that, that, that that's the, the the stereotype one of our questioners uh, has asked uh, have you uh, done kung fu fighting <laughs> no actually so but i don't need to it's i mean it's in my blood right that's just how it works mm. i don't need to it's mm. just an instinct uh, but my, my wife and i always joke that you know because she's um like half mexican and uh, ha half latino and a whole mix of breeds in 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 from mexico that you know she'll be old and, <laughs> and white-haired and everything and i'll still look like a teenager but uh no no i don't do any martial arts i'm i'm i wanted to get into jujitsu but just what when i got my gi and i was just about to start they closed the gym down because of the lockdowns uh now you were born in raised in Australia, uh, one of the, the things that uh, the mainstream media has tried to uh, amplify, and there, there sadly have been some, sadly some instances of uh, public vilification of Asian uh, Australians. Uh, have you had any of that uh, firsthand? I don't know. I haven't had anybody sort of yell at me. And so I do sometimes wonder when, you know, when I go to the shops by myself and I'm buying like a lot of things because I've got a big family. I wonder whether, you know, the people think I'm like this <laughs> Asian guy that's hoarding and I'm going to ship it off to China. But it, it was funny because we, when, when we were actually talking about, you know, speaking out against the lockdown, uh, that did sort of come up in conversation where it's like very funny that I'm actually an Asian born Australian. You know, I look Asian. I'm, 
I'm as far from Asian as you can imagine. They call us bananas, right? Where you're yellow on the outside and, and white on the inside. Because I was born and raised here. I had Australian friends growing up. So whilst my parents have an Asian culture, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very much Australian. So we did joke about that. And, and I think that just that I think that's just what made the situation even more perfect, right? Because if I was maybe a, just somebody that was just like a white Australian male, then they'll, they'll play the race card. And then if if if, if, I, if they say it was because you're Chinese, well, I'm an Australian-born Chinese. If they say you're racist, if I, if I was, my, my exercise partner was another Chinese person, they'd be like, oh, that's why they're against. But the, my exercise partner is like a white English Australian. <laughs> so it's just, it was just funny. It was almost like it was bulletproof. It was, uh, I think what is bamboozled, the, the usual, as I call them, race baiters, is that the, the, the anti-lockdown movement, or as I call them, the new freedom uh, fighters, it's a, a broad section, uh, dare I use the word, diverse uh, uh, section of uh, Australians, and also diverse uh, politically. I mean, not all of them, are, uh, as the expression goes, extreme far right uh, extremists. They're just people who woke up one day and found out they didn't have their rights anymore. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And, uh, you know, I think that's why it's important to have single issue causes because it brings people together from all different backgrounds. And, yeah, like you said, there's, there's plenty of different people that are there. Uh, the, the millions march against mandatory vaccines, I think, is is was a, a, an event that was already planned. But I think it just became like a vaccine slash anti-lockdown march just because of the timing. And also, I guess, my stuff naturally led up to that event. So, but yeah, when I talk to the people there, there's people from all walks of life, definitely. Uh, let's talk about uh, week five of your exercise that was on uh, Mother's Day Eve uh, before mm -hmm. the, as I mentioned in my uh, introduction, the disgraceful uh, Victoria Police shutdown and, and manhandling of the speakers and organisers uh, at that uh, rally outside Victoria's Parliament House. But on the Saturday, uh, it was, and uh, the video went viral uh, when uh, Renee uh, uh, Alkari, uh, where she was taken into custody uh, by police uh, with her uh, young son uh, standing silently with a protest sign. She wasn't uh, exercising, which made her a, a much easier uh, target. Uh, you were also arrested as well after several uh, interactions with police. There's an edited version of that uh, live uh, on your YouTube channel. Uh, but it, that, especially the footage of, of Renee, because arresting a, a mother with a, with a child, it just... It, it distressed me seeing it. And there are a lot of people who said, why should she bring her child uh, to that uh, uh, protest? But the fact that she, she, uh, she was clearly practicing social uh, distancing and no one was at risk. I mean, if, you, if, you, if you're worried about catching the coronavirus, then stay uh, uh, locked down uh, yourself. But it, it appeared to me that because the police saw you both as, as locked down uh, dissidents and knew how to assert uh, your rights and and if you watch the footage, the uh, the, the the police officers like, oh, you've got all, all of these political messages uh, on your on your attire and you're you're holding uh, the sign. There's there's nothing in the public health order that says uh, you're not allowed to wear uh, political shirts when you're when you're exercising. I, I saw that. What is it? They said you're not within the spirit of the the legislation. Well, I didn't know that legislation had a spirit in it. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I'm not a legal professional. I mean, we just sort of looked at the laws and saw um, something we could use to, to do what we wanted to do. So, um, yeah, I mean, it doesn't tell you what you can wear or what you can carry. I mean, once they can tell you what you can carry, are they going to specify certain, certain exercise equipment that you can carry? Um, but, but Renee, actually, she was actually exercising. I mean, she was walking around just like I was. Um, so she was, I mean, obviously when you go and exercise, you don't have to be constantly moving. So yeah, there were some times where she had stopped and was resting or her, her son was playing on the fence or whatnot. But 
it was actually the um, it was actually the police that stopped her. You know, like because because the the way you know, I guess if people were doing the same thing I was, I mean, my plan was to go there and constantly be on the move. So we were pacing up and down Parliament House. So she she definitely was exercising. Yeah, I noticed uh, in a video I saw of the. Uh, the, the UK anti-lockdown demonstrators in, in Hyde Park, when the police came over to them, they started doing uh, uh, the, <laughs> the, 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 what do you call them when you do like that, uh, outstretched? Like star jumps. Yeah, yeah, star jumps. They started, started doing those and <laughs> I was sort of like nicely uh, played. But the whole thing, uh, and, and this is the thing, it's up to the discretion of the, the officers. It's subjective, which is not what law should be. It should be objective and we still don't know whether uh, all of the uh, all of the issuance of these fines were legal at all they could be all ruled uh, invalid uh, that's because the courts are clogged up uh, at the moment but the fact that it's the officer right there uh, at the time and we know that uh, not all police officers but some don't like well they think of somebody like you as a as a smart ass yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I don't know what's going to be the outcome of my court case, what's going to be the outcome of Renee's. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with you that laws are there to prohibit what you can't do. Um, if it doesn't plainly state it, then you have a right to do, you have you have freedom. Uh, but yeah, I mean, on that day, I mean, a lot of people give Renee a lot of hassle for bringing her son along. And, and one thing I think it's important for people to know is if you, if you were there on that day, you would realize how little people were there. I mean, when we're talking to Sergeant Davey, the group is kind of congregated there because he's talking to everyone and everyone's interested in what's going on. But when you're walking up and down Parliament House, I mean, that stretch of path is pretty long. I mean, people were quite spread out. There were plenty of times in the live when you you look behind me in the live stream, there's nobody in front of Parliament House. And and it, there's even le there was even less people in the city in week five than there was the few weeks later when the lockdowns started to ease, right? Because on that week five, it was te you technically still needed a reasonable excuse to go out, but the week after they couldn't do anything because the reasonable excuses weren't there anymore because you could go out in groups of 10, right? So, so it, it wasn't just limited to people exercising in pairs anymore. And that's why I don't know whether by good fortune or good, um, uh, you know, good planning, the, the police didn't do anything because if they did, I think it would have blown up even more which is kind of like what I wanted them to do from the beginning, which is just, just to leave me alone and just uh, go about my exercising. So what, but one thing is Renee had already spoken to a few police officers. See, when you see her getting arrested, that's actually the fourth encounter because she speaks to a few constables to begin with. They question her and then leave her alone. And then, then she talks to Sergeant o, uh, Inspector O'Donnell. And I think that's when she's already decided I'm going to arrest this woman because she's kind of stood me up in front of all my constables. She then comes over and joins the group with Sergeant Davey, who also has a conversation with her and is fine to let her be and keep and let, let us keep exercising. And it was actually when she left to go home. So she's actually leaving that O'Donnell comes to get her. So, you know, even if, you know, O'Donnell wants to try and make a point that she didn't give me a name and blah, blah, I can arrest her for that. I mean, I think most of the public would think that you're not really using your discretion where there's no danger, there's nobody around, the woman's walking. Okay, she's got a sign expressing her dissent with the lockdown. She's on her way home. So she is leaving. And then you decide to drag her and throw her into the back of a car and, and violently as well. I mean, they could have just detained her, let her calm down, explain to her what was going to happen, let her child sit in the car with her, you know, and, 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 you know, I guess ask her for some cooperation if they really wanted to push the point. But I don't think anybody can justify what they did in the way they did it. And to the people saying, oh, why did you bring your child along? I mean, people bring their children along to protests all the time, you know, protest-like events. And, you know, people bring them to marches, people bring them to the climate march, people bring them to all sorts of things. And you do that because you don't expect it to get violent. You expect it to be a peaceful thing that you're doing. You shouldn't worry about like brutality from the police. So she just thought she was coming. She And the fact that it was just a walk outside Parliament House 
that's that's why she wanted to do it because she's never she told me she had never been to any um any protests before other protests so she came because it was just a walk and she didn't expect it to be violent so um to the people criticizing her for bringing her child i think it's completely unjustified it seemed like they were doing what I call uh, Cartman policing there, that uh, uh, you people there were not uh, respecting our authority. <laughs> because... Uh, I guess so. I mean, they can have... Obviously, that's a, a factor, but yeah. Uh, because I noticed in one of your interactions, because uh, uh, people are wearing your, your mer merchandise and they're saying, how can you be here just with one other person? Look, there's people dressed the, uh, the same as you. And... Like, obviously, they decided that they were inspired by you, but there seemed to be this underlying re resentment that you'd started this the, this movement. Well, I think so. And I, I know they're in, in a rock and a hard place. And I suppose that's sort of the situation that we find ourselves in, that I am sort of keeping the law and, and finding a way to do something, staying within the law. So as much as they, you know, and that's why it comes to a head, right? Because they 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 know that, you know, like it seems like something that would be illegal, but it's not. So it depends what stance they were going to take uh, when they finally um, clashed with me. But just to correct you there, like it's not my merchandise because I, I didn't sell them any. They made their own T-shirts, right? So it, it's if people make their own things, um, you know, obviously it'll look the same. But, uh, you know, I, I didn't sell it to them. And I specifically did that because I didn't want to be accused of, of, of organizing a group there like most protests do, right? Most protests, they gather, they speak to the people, there's chants, they may be selling merchandise there. So uh, my idea was I will do this as an individual. And if other people want to do it as individuals in the same place as well, then that removes, um, then that should keep it within the, the confines of the public health order, which was the point I was trying to make. And that's why... Um, that's why Renee um, was, is, a, was a, is a different scenario to me because she refused to give her details to the police. So because she refused to give her name and details, they had uh, like, you know, whether you agree with it or not, they had under New South Wales law uh, a, a reasonable a reason to arrest her and bring and detain her to get her details because they suspect her of breaking the COVID laws. But because I gave my name and my details, um, I wanted the discussion to be more about, am I breaking the public health order? So that's the discussion I wanted people to see if police made an issue of it. If they didn't, then, you know, it would hopefully uh, encourage others to do the same. Uh, there's a question here from Anxious Aussie. Who created the edited video of uh, Renee's incident that caused so much outrage? Because there's normally sort of one... Uh, there was one bit of footage which uh, did the rounds on the, the media and that. And as you said, it was her fourth uh, encounter. Uh, I don't think that was... I think the one that went viral wasn't edited. I think that was just one lady that was there that recorded it and then just shared it with a bunch of people she knew. And then it just spread like wildfire. I think a few people that have followers online shared that unedited footage and then it went out so i don't know if you're referring to my edit so obviously the videos i have on my channel are edited by me but you um, still have the live the one that though, went viral on your is... facebook page yep uh, so there is you still do have the the, the raw footage but uh, your youtube channel that's where you do the uh, the edits along with your uh, your commentary from where you are now yeah, yeah. So um, the, the I, I wasn't actually up close um, recording because when Renee got uh, arrested, I don't know if you remember, when oh, Renee yeah, got arrested, that, yeah. they had set up a barricade, right? So that I, I couldn't actually get close. And when I tried to get closer to take some footage, that's when I got arrested. So the footage of Renee in my videos is obviously taken from other people, but it would be the people that are screaming and shouting around her while she was getting dragged into the back of the paddy wagon. Um, it was one of those ladies' footage that went viral. That's, that's what most people saw to begin with. Yeah, I, I, my, my, mine was later because, see, when that all happened, I did have a lot of media reach out to me, but I, I didn't really want to chat with anybody at that time because I wanted to tell my story first. So I've, I, that's why I, I have obligations on Sundays with church and then you know, it takes me a while to go through all the footage and edit it and stuff. So I think my cut didn't get out there until like maybe Wednesday or Thursday. 
which was explaining what had happened and, and the footage that people didn't see with the police. You don't have the, the resources of the mainstream media who go back to the, the studio with their, their, their vans and then edit it for the, the six o'clock news, don't have a team of, of 20 uh, or whatever, but uh, exactly. their, 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 their teams, uh, uh, as, as we've seen, uh, are getting cut uh, uh, as well. Maybe if they didn't uh, report so much uh, fake news, and you mentioned you've been involved in ac activism before against abortion and same-sex marriage, so you would know the slant that the mainstream media uh, puts on things. And they've treated the, the, the anti-lockdown movement, the lockdown dissidents as uh, irresponsible uh, anti-science conspiracy theorists who, well, therefore, they're not entitled to, to free speech or, or, or thought. Many who've uh, attended the, the various protest rallies, uh, uh, they, they are a part of uh, uh, groups that are skeptical of uh, vaccines and uh, 5G uh, uh, telecommunications. Uh, you've done interviews with the Australian Vaccination Risks uh, Network, which would see you labelled as an anti-vaxxer. Uh, it's something that uh, I, a lot of people have uh, said to me over the years about the the unshackled. Uh, you, you like you should talk about uh, vaccines more. And my position is like I, I don't know lots of details about what's in the vaccines, and because to, to research that yourself, but as uh, as a, a believer in liberty like yourself, like you cannot uh, forcibly inject somebody with anything against their, their will. You just can't do that. And that's what we've really seen with the, the, the no jab, no play for professional athletes in, uh, in Queensland. It is, it is still a legitimate grievance, uh, I think. Uh, but on top of that, there's more to the, the, the lockdown dissidents than just those two issues. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I, I don't know how much government funding, you know, Channel 7, Channel 9, Channel 10 get. I mean, obviously, if they're government funded, then they, they should be completely neutral. But if it's a, in a free market, um, you know, they, they can report it how they want, as long as it's not slanderous and libel. Um, you know, that's just up to more people that are liberty minded or, you know, if you have a left wing media, more right wing people need to get involved. And I think that's what was my message at that the march against uh, mandatory vac vaccinations is, you know, if we just sit on the couch and just yell at the TV and complain and don't do anything about it, then um, we only have ourselves to blame. So we can't just complain about the media that's out there, but yet none, nobody on our side is in the media or, or creating, in, creating competition in that market. So they're going to swing it their way. Um, I guess we just have to fight back, uh, you know, with citizen journalists and independent journalists and whatnot. But yeah, all sorts of people come together. Um, yeah, it has been painted as a more, you know, anti-5G, anti-vaccine uh, rally and whatnot. And it, it must be because obviously it, 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 it peaked at um, that and also obviously a lot of people who are against mandatory vaccinations are upset at this crisis being used to push that agenda. So I don't know whether they'll ever be able to make it mandatory because that would be an infringement on people's rights. I mean, they'll try, you know, I guess they haven't, it hasn't stopped them before. But um, I know when I spoke to Merrill, it's like they can't sort of deny a child's school because Australia is signed up to the international conventions of human rights and you have a right to education. So whether your position, whatever your position on that is, I think that's why they haven't gone that far yet. So that's why they're able to get away with no jab, no pay, which is like government entitlements and no jab, no play because childcare centers fall under early learning. They don't fall under education. And obviously you don't have a right to government entitlement. So I, I still uh, disagree that, you know, people should be financially disincented, like uh, I say, it's financially uh, impacted in order to make them take some sort of medication. But, uh, you know, that's why they can get away with it without it being an infringement on human rights, because you, you can't claim a right to government entitlement. So they can just make your life extremely difficult, whether that is a case for strong coercion because i know consent must be absent from strong financial coercion so i don't know if there's maybe some class action that's addressing that point 
It's called nudge politics, where you don't explicitly mm -hmm. legislate uh, against something, but you can nudge people, use the power of the uh, the authority of the, the state to sort of nudge people to do uh, what you want them to do. Yeah, so I think more of us who believe in liberty need to get involved in politics so that, you know, I like what the Liberal Democrats say. They say, you know, uh, libertarians want to get into government so they can leave you alone. <laughs> That's, I, I agree with with uh, that uh, sort of overall mentality, even though we may disagree on uh, little things here and there, uh, on some policies here and there. But, yeah, I mean, one thing I would like to say is, you know, just because you talk to somebody and just because you're interviewed by somebody, that doesn't necessarily mean you agree with them 100%. I mean, you probably interview all sorts of people from yeah. all sorts of walks of life, you know, and if people will say like, well, why would you interview this person? Give them a platform. Why would you interview these people? I mean, because there are benefits to, you know, um, utilizing each other's audiences and whatnot. But just because I'm interviewed by Meryl Dory, that doesn't mean we agree 100%. I mean, I definitely agree with her stance of health freedom and her fight to, to maintain that freedom to, to decide because they're not, they're not forcing people not to get vaccinated. If you want to get vaccinated, go ahead. You know, so the fight is if you don't want to get vaccinated, you should have the right to not get vaccinated. And the government shouldn't be using our tax dollars to, you know, make it more incentivized for one person who decides that medical choice and another person that doesn't so yeah obviously when it gets into all the science of it and and uh all the arguments there i'm like you i'm not an expert on it obviously i have my choice on what i've decided to do for my family i don't vaccinate my family but i just believe everybody should have the right to choose their own level of risk if they want to vaccinate their children they can if they don't want to they don't have to and if somebody is worried about catching some disease, then like with the coronavirus, they can stay home until yeah. they feel safe. And when, when you feel safe again to let your children and yourself engage into society with all these scary unvaccinated people out there that, you know, don't even have the disease you're worried about catching to begin with, then, um, then that's the risk you take. But you don't have a right to remove other people's rights. Uh, and it's very similar to vaccination. Right? You don't have a right to remove somebody else's right because you're worried because they're unvaccinated. Um, to keep you safe, you you have to decide whether or not to take the risk to engage in society. The lockdown lovies, as I uh, call them, if if you're uh, enjoying the lockdown, you can keep yourself lo uh, locked down. I mean, there's no law that says uh, uh, there was no law before that said uh, you had to go outside of your home. You can just stay there, and you have the uh, uh, we have the the e-commerce uh, facilities so that you never have to go out to the shops or or anything. You can just live as a recluse <laughs> if you're scared of uh, any form of uh, human uh, disease. You're sleep. yeah. Get a get a job where you can work from home. You know, and uh, now nowadays with VPNs, you can work from home, do everything you need to. From I mean, most of us, even when we go to the office, we're sitting in front of a, of a computer and. I think this is one thing businesses have realized. They're like, oh, we don't need everybody working in the office. We can have everyone operate from home. But obviously there's pros and cons to having people operate at home. Mm. But but you're absolutely right. I mean, even if even if the, the kill rate or the mortality rate of the disease was a lot higher, let's say it was 20, 30, 40, 50 percent, you still don't have a right to restrict somebody's movement. They can decide whether or not they take the risk. And if they take the risk, they've obviously decided for themselves that the risk, the return was worth the risk. And most wise people, if there really was something out there that they were worried about, would stay home, right? So you don't have to force them to stay home anyway. But even if there was something out there and you decided to go out, the only people that should be out there are the, also the other people that are willing to take the risk. So I don't know what all these pro-lockdown people are worried about. If they're so worried and they're so for the lockdown, all the people that are worried and for the lockdown should be shut up in their homes anyway. I should never run into you at, at the shops. And and why are you, you say, well, you're going to spread it to somebody that's going to spread it to me. Well, why are you letting somebody in your house that has been out and about in the big scary world, possibly catching coronavirus? I mean, if you're so worried, you should just quarantine yourself from everybody, anybody that's had interaction with anybody. And then you don't even have to worry. And then the people that are out and about supposedly spreading it to each other and killing everybody are the, are the ones that are willing to take the risk. They're already out. The fact that they're out, they're willing to take the risk. So I just think there's no way you can really defend removing somebody's rights unless you just believe in an authoritarian government and that you just believe that authoritarian government has the right to just tell people what to do in every area of their life.
Well, you're a Sydney side, eh? They, they, they shut down all of Sydney's nightlife because of, of two uh, one-punch uh, deaths. We've sh shut down basically the whole economy over, or as it stands, 102 deaths. But that was a, a microcosm of what was to come. They've eventually lifted uh, the uh, si uh, uh, Sydney's uh, uh, lockout laws uh, in the hope of uh, returning uh, Sydney's uh, nightlife. Uh, I, you don't strike me as, as somebody who regularly goes to <laughs> yeah. King's Cross on a Saturday night uh, for, uh, uh, yeah. for a wild night. I uh, but be you dead there. Yeah, but you don't want to take <laughs> away uh, other people's rights if they want to go to King's Cross and have a fun night out. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's probably where I'm a bit of a unique conservative, where I, I, I don't think um, drugs and alcohol and whatnot should be cr a criminal. Um, I think people can have the right to unfortunately destroy their own body and, and live lifestyles that are detrimental to their health. Um, so, yeah, it was funny because when all these lockdowns happened, somebody was telling me about the Sydney lockdowns and I didn't even know because I'm not originally from Sydney. I'm originally from Perth. So maybe I wasn't around when all the hoo-ha about this, the lockout laws were on. But even if I was, I, they probably never came across my desk because, uh, you know, uh, me and the people that I associate with are, are not those sort of people that go out late at night and get drunk and have that sort of party lifestyle um, at, at this point in my life. I, I mean, I did when I was younger, uh, you know, obviously when I, when I had different values back then. So, yeah, so I, I was not affected by those at all, and um, I didn't even realize something like that had happened. But I, I definitely am for liberty. If people want to do that, then then they can. It's up to them. I wouldn't recommend it, but they have the freedom to, like I said, destroy their own health. Well, I'm not a, a sporting shooter or a, a hunter, but I certainly uh, respect and, and advocate for, for people's rights to uh, engage uh, in that in that activity, uh, just because, and this is a libertarian thing, just because you don't like something, or it's it's it, it's not your cup of tea, doesn't mean uh, that it has to be uh, shut down. Which is basically uh, the position of these these nanny uh, status, and also with the uh, because yep. the, uh, the the government slogans have been "Stay home, uh, save lives." This simplistic. Uh, uh, for a four-word slogan, uh, as as a lot of uh, political cynics call it, uh, but there there hasn't uh, there's been some uh, discussion about uh, the other uh, health uh, effects to people's lives and livelihoods of the uh, the economic shutdowns and and lockdowns, uh, mental health, the fact that our hospitals had to be emptied because they were going to be flooded with coronavirus patients, uh, some haven't been able to go to their, their, their cancer uh, treatments. We could be having more cancer uh, deaths uh, uh, down, uh, down the track. There's, there's just been this uh, a single focus, which, and if you, uh, if you bring up any of these other factors, then it's like, oh, you want people to die from coronavirus. Right. I think your device is just disconnected, by the yeah, way. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, you keep okay. talking. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with your sentiment. I think when people think about the benefits of lockdown, they're completely um, not thinking about the detriments of lockdown. And, you know, when it comes to political slogans and all that sort of stuff, it's all marketing, isn't it? I mean, they, they're, they're trying to say the save lives so that it just makes everybody think that's the only way you can save lives is if you uh, stay home and everything like that. And that's why my sign kind of played on that. So it's like, hey, well, you can save lives by ending the lockdown to try and uh, help people understand, hey, there's lives on both sides. Like just because it's not money versus lives. Because money is a means to an end. Money, people that don't have a lot of money, uh, a, a, like a bankrupt and poor society is also an unhealthy society that leads to, you know, mental health and all sorts of things, not getting the required care. I mean, if we were not a prosperous nation, uh, we wouldn't have the hospitals to even save people to begin with. So I think people are definitely... Um, People are definitely uh, understating the, the negative effects of the lockdown. And see, I take a big interest when it comes to 
uh, like to the, the the topics when it comes to economics. I've, I just have really been interested in how economics works. I'm a big fan of of Peter Schiff, and I, I listen to a lot of Milton Friedman, and I I read the articles from the Mises in Institute as well. I don't know if you pronounce it Mises. Mises, but, yes. You know, I yeah, that stuff Mises really interests. Yeah, that stuff just really interests me, like how government should work. And, and then when you start learning about all stuff, that stuff, you realize how far our government is from an ideal limited government situation. So when the lockdowns happen, I knew that there would be huge economic effects even before people are talking about it now. You can't just stop everyone from working and think that everything is just going to be, you just switch it back on, um, you know, after, you know, a month or two months or whatever. There's going to be huge ramifications. So I thought, at the time, like I thought when, when we were going to go into lockdown, I honestly thought it would be like two, three, four weeks because, you know, when somebody comes from overseas, what are they quarantined for? Two weeks. So why are we locked down for like, you know, three months now almost? And we're getting on to three months. So, uh, you know, I didn't think it would be easing off that much. So that's why, um, you know, now that it's starting to ease off, my life is starting to go back to normal. So I don't know, uh, next week I won't have the time on Saturdays anymore to, to keep on exercising at Parliament House because now I've got to take my kids to soccer again. And so things are starting to get back to normal. But when I first started it, I didn't think it would be going for eight weeks. I thought maybe a month tops. <laughs> well, uh, I'm not sure if you're also familiar with the work of, of Robert Higgs. Uh, he wrote the, the classic uh, book, Crisis in uh, Leviathan, uh, where he talks about the, the ratchet effect when there is a crisis such as this and uh, there's uh, uncertainty that people are in fear, the, the government implements a, a whole bunch of measures and programs. And this is going to be another challenge now to roll back uh, job seeker, job keeper, uh, all of those uh, yeah. measures and that. And this is what uh, in, in Robert Higgs, Higgs books, he, he documents uh, episodes in, in government growth in the, the United States and you can uh, apply it to uh, Australia uh, as well. And the reason they, uh, they, they stay in uh, a bigger and bigger government is because people don't exercise uh, their rights. I mean, you really think that uh, the, the government is just going to suddenly decide to give you your, your civil rights back. You're just going to sit on the couch and, and hope that, well, uh, they'll know when the time is right to let you, let, let you be out of the house or be cl close with somebody in public. But see, this is the thing, right? I mean, who, who is the government? I mean, the go in a dem in a democracy, we, we are the government, right? Like we, we have elected them in because they're the ones running for office. So the, the, often the problem is when people look at our politicians and they think, oh, what a bunch of scumbags or whatnot. Well, where are all the good people? See, the problem is a lot of good people are t busy with their own, like a lot of good people don't get into politics, right? They don't, they don't play that game. And, and that's part of the problem, right? And a lot of, even a lot of libertarians or anarchists, you know, people that you talk to, they think that participating in the system is condoning of the system. But, you know, we just happen to live in a democracy. This is the system we find ourselves in. We can't just sit back and complain who's in there because if we do, we, we get the government we deserve because we are not doing anything to change it. So the only way we're going to be able to roll back these policies is if more people who are economically, cons uh, economically um, I guess, conser would you say economically conservative, we need to get involved to push these policies. If we if we don't get involved, what's left? The left. What's left is the left, right? That's left in politics. Well, and you keep saying, oh, they're passing all these laws. Well, if we don't get involved, then there's no resistance at all. And that's why, you know, I think I think people should be involved in one way or another. Um, and I, and it's funny because I when I think about it, there's because the, Christians think the same way as well, and it frustrates me to no end. They think like the the either like the atheist anarchist, atheist anarchist, where they just are so disgusted with the system that they don't participate. And the ironic thing is, is if all those people that thought that way actually participated, it might actually be a different world. <laughs> Yeah, well, the, th the thing is that uh, the, the left and the big government types, uh, they have uh, the media, the, the cultural institutions, a lot of the, the, the big corporations all 
uh, behind them. Uh, yeah, that doesn't excuse uh, uh, excuse people uh, on our side from uh, getting involved, exercising their own rights. Mm -hmm. But it shows that it's sort of it's not as simple as just getting more more people in, involved. And this is why I started the the Unshackled to be uh, a force against this. What I see is the the, the mainstream media uh, uh, protection racket. Well, absolutely. And we can get involved in all different sorts of ways. So like what you're doing is fighting against mainstream media. But yeah, it just means we have to fight harder. So, you know, they may have the resources behind them, but ultimately in a democracy, it's a numbers game. So we fight harder. Um, I mean, even if, you know, I'm not expecting that we will take a, you know, I know where this world is ending at the end game, but you know what? We shouldn't go down without a fight. You know, so if it's the people that have the attitude of just giving up, they're making it worse faster. But if we we don't know whether we might be on an uptick in history, right? Because history goes up and down in ebbs and flows. And who knows if we are part of the generation where we make a difference and we can at least uptick it and prolong the inevitable. Who knows how many more lives we might save if uh, we have we are better economically, uh, better socially as well. Um, you know, it'll be a very different society. Well, there have been even periods in modern history when everyone thought the world was going to end and there was going to be uh, uh, anarchy worldwide, not the, not the good uh, anarcho-capitalist uh, anarchy, but uh, the, the lawlessness barbarian one. But uh, the good times uh, return. This is just uh, a, a life in society is, is volatile, and that's uh, what I'm going to get into the, the, the second half uh, uh, with the, uh, the riots and the civil unrest in, in the United States. Uh, how does it make you feel that it, 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 you've uh, experienced harassment by the police and uh, obviously these, uh, these anti-lockdown uh, rallies, uh, they've had the, the police monitoring them, almost trying to bait them into reacting, yet this week... Uh, a lot of them, they were locked down lovies uh, a week ago, but now they want to get out on the streets and, hold, and import uh, Black Lives Matter rallies. And I know that uh, our Victoria police, imagine my shock, has simply rolled over saying, oh, we don't want it to be uh, you know, violent, uh, Victoria police were there. Uh, given that they, the, the double standard has been uh, exposed since our police minister, Lisa Neville, said they, oh, they probably won't be issued fines, Victoria police today have sort of said, you know, people attending think about uh, uh, the, the the public health hazard you might be uh, creating but it's a stark double standard here well you know you don't expect people with uh, you know lower levels of integrity to be consistent but at the same time I mean these these are uh, I don't know what they're called are they called Black Lives Matter protests um, they're happening at a different time during the lockdown as well. Because if you think about it, I mean, we we didn't get I, in Sydney anyway at the at the Saturday uh, rally. Um, that protest didn't get any hassle from the police. I mean, they were also saying, "Hey, keep social distancing and everything." And they they're just doing their job, right? Because I'm sure they have to be seen encouraging groups of ten and social distancing. Mm. But at the same time, they didn't cause any trouble on Saturday at all. I mm. mean, they were there um, protecting people's right to protest. So I think, uh, you know, I was doing it at a different time. So that put, put, put them in between a rock and a hard place, uh, what I was doing as an individual. So I, I, I can imagine that the media and maybe people would be sympathetic to the cause because it's it's like something, it's a cause that the media loves, right? They love the, the racial stuff, uh, anything that fuels racial debate. Uh, so maybe that's why they're for it and it's just a different time. So I don't know how much of it is an agenda and how many, how much of it is, well, we're at a different time of the lockdown as well where different things are acceptable. Because even I read an article just recently where it's saying, oh, Victoria is not going to fine the people. But even within the article, I mean, the, the police commissioner in Victoria is still telling them that you should be in groups of 10, well, and everything, uh, which uh, is pretty much what happened at the Sydney protest on Saturday. Yeah. So I don't think it's necessarily the police treating them different i mean when it comes to the issue itself i mean i'm i'm completely against i don't even think there's such thing as races you know we all come from we're all made of one blood the bible says and you know the, the difference between you me and a black person is just the, the density of the pigment in our skin mm. you know where there's there's one race it's the human race so the people that are 
you know, the people that are pushing rights for a race are actually the racists because they're recognizing that races even exist. You know, so if, if there's no difference between you and me, it's just the, the, the amount of pigment in our skin. To say Black Lives Matter, that person's being racist because why? what, what makes somebody black? It's you know? all very it's just, uh, confusing. Yeah, that's why, yeah. you know, all lives matter. Mm. You know, like, yeah, to me... They, how come I, there's, they're, they're not holding, what is it, Asian... Uh, a, uh, Asian respect yeah. since... Uh, yeah, where's the yellow lives matter? <laughs> uh, the camera's so, gone gone out yeah. again here. Uh, uh, I'll, okay. uh, so I'll so read it's this. It's so silly. Yeah. That, um, and oh, here we go. and that's, what I, that's what I hate about, you know, this sort of social responsibility, this sort of push for making everybody equal and then it just makes everybody unequal like i i hate the fact that companies are forced to you know have you know gender quotas and you know do things for aboriginals they don't do it for anybody else so i'm not against if people want to do that but it's just to, to, to do it in the name of equality it just doesn't make sense that you you do it in the name of equality but then you only do it for one religion or you only do it for one race or you only do it for one gender you know if it's going to be equal and you're going to have an Aboriginal Appreciation Day, well, then have also a Chinese... Why don't just have a day where you appreciate all cultures? <laughs> it's like you want to do it equal, but then you only do it for one culture? That doesn't make sense. Uh, the famous animal farm saying uh, some animals are more equal than others. Uh, just to finish off, we have got a, a Super Chat, Senator a Slayer, US $3. How many Chinese spies are operating in Australia? What is their main objective? Are they close to the, the Labour Party? You certainly don't strike me as a, a CC CCP spy if you're advocating freedom and liberty, but I do know that the CCP, uh, they do harass uh, the uh, uh, Australian Chinese who have uh, family members back in China. Do they? Yeah, I, I wouldn't know. I mean, my family is Malaysian Chinese, so um, my, even my family is not connected really with the Chinese at all, so I, I don't know much about it, and I've lived here my whole life, but, um, you know, if, if somebody's going to think that I'm some CCP in, infiltrator, I mean, when it comes to people that, that are convinced of one narrative, it doesn't matter what you say, they're always going to think <laughs> think that of you. I'm sure you get the same thing, right? Maybe you're, you're like a controlled opposition. I'm sure you get that what, what, what's the, 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 the previous uh, thing with, what is it, Russiagate, uh, that all the, 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 the pro-Trump uh, alternative media was all funded by Russia. That's the... <laughs> That, that was sort of the slur yeah. against us. That's why even with this exercising my rights thing and people ask, oh, why are the lockdown? Yeah, I make my argument. It doesn't, it doesn't matter why they're pushing the lockdown. It could be, is it a conspiracy? Is it that it's authoritarian control? Is it that they're just misguided? Is it just that people genuinely believe that they are doing good by getting everyone to lock down. But it doesn't matter what the agenda is, because where I'm arguing it from, it doesn't matter why you want to do it, what you're doing is wrong. So, you know, the, how you read the, the road to, to hell, they say, is paved with good intentions. So people can have the best intentions in the world, but that doesn't mean what you're doing is actually uh, morally right. So you don't have the right to remove my rights just because you're scared or whatever agenda you have. So I think if we come at it from that angle, that is the strongest argument. And then we don't get caught up into the, you know, uh, it's because they wanted to roll out 5G and it's because they, and I'm not saying I agree with all these theories, but when you get caught up in all the theories, then um, you just got to decide how you're going to argue it. Because I feel that the, the way I'm trying to take a stand is, is a bit more bulletproof than um, bringing in something that you can't necessarily justify. Uh, so what's the plan for the, the, the future now? Uh, it'll be uh, week nine. Uh, if you, if you're, you're going out again uh, this Saturday, you're just going to keep keep, do, uh, ke uh, ke keep this uh, rights exercising uh, uh, going. I know that um, uh, Thanos, uh, who uh, I mentioned in my introduction, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Victoria Police issued him with a... Uh, a statement which was sort of said your security license is is under review he's a security guard so they've basically taken away mm. uh his uh livelihood so he's sort of wanting to just focus on on activism now but obviously you've got your your church and your your congregation and your family 
uh, as well. Even though you've all met uh, through this, uh, you you, uh, you came came to this as as individuals. So obviously, you've got different sort of goals for the future in mind. Yeah, I actually don't know Fannis at all. I've never spoken to him. I've never met him. So, you know, it's funny. This article came out that there's yeah. all these leaders of these wild protests. And I have no idea who these people are. I've never met them. And I've never talked to them. <laughs> but um, I'm one of the masterminds, it seems. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, plans moving forward. I mean, that's why next next week things are already easing up. My kids' classes are on again, so I have to take them. So, unfortunately, I will no longer be exercising on Saturdays, but that doesn't mean I'm bowing out of the fight. The, the Smoke and Joe McHale from Save the World Army and Garth, who was um, wearing the bandana and had a vendetta t-shirt, he was the guy on Channel 7 News with the exercising for police state sign. They asked if they could carry the torch in my absence, so they're going to keep going there every Saturday, uh, exercising and, and, and encourage people to go. So if you're free and you're able to, you know, you can go. What I was finding that, you know, it sort of turned into a place where you can kind of network with like-minded people. So it was kind of nice just going there and <laughs> it being like a spot where you would run into other people that had similar thoughts to you and just walk up and down and have a chat. That's what I was kind of enjoying in the last eight weeks. Mm. But moving forward, there's still the updates for the court case to tell people about. So uh, I plan on using this channel just to keep sharing information to um, give people updates about my court case as it rolls out and also Renee's court case as well. Uh, and also um, I might as well, I might use it as well to attend other rallies and events that I can find, I, I am able to go to and continue doing the live stream. So I can go there and talk to people and take people along, sort of tagging along with me through that live stream avenue. I think people were enjoying that. It's funny how when the, the government takes people's rights away, there's a whole new generation of activists who uh, who rise up and uh, uh, challenge the state's power. It's funny how that works. I know. And that's why I think they would be a bit wiser about it. I mean, you know, there's the whole, uh, you know, 1984 versus Brave New World, right? People mm. always sort of compare those two. I would think the government would be smart about it and they'd go the Brave New World route, right? Because the Brave New World is just keep people entertained. See, that's the problem is that yeah. people were so busy with life, like I was as well, and then you shut everything down and now people are at home brewing like, how do I like get mm -hmm. back at what they've just done to me? And, um, y you know, that's sort of the oppression that comes and it makes people rise up. Mm. So... You know, if I was an oppressive government, I would probably go that route. But <laughs> I don't know. They, maybe they haven't learned their lesson yet to, to do it a bit of a more subtle way. Well, we've run out of time. Uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed uh, chatting with you, you Victor. Uh, congratulations on your, your activism and really uh, making a difference. Uh, hopefully in the near future, I can get up to, to Sydney and uh, shake your hand, uh, have that <laughs> physical uh, contact. It'd be great. Yeah, thanks a lot, man. Thanks for having me on. Take care. See ya. Thanks for tuning in to Wilmsfront. Visit timwilms.com or Rational Rise TV to view the archive of episodes. And keep visiting theunshackled.net to view all our shows. And to keep up with the latest real news and analysis.